So our lectionary passage is from the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but So I've explained this before, but the way the lectionary works is it gives you kind of a Gospel passage and it gives you a, a psalm and it gives you an epistle and it gives you an Old Testament passage. And normally there is some kind of clear relationship between those different passages that hold them together and why the, the framers of this, um, this kind of Bible study have said these, these ideas we hold together. Uh, so the, whilst the gospel passage for today is in Matthew chapter 10, uh, verses 40 to 42, we're actually predominantly going to be looking at the Old Testament passage um, in Genesis. Uh, so I'm going to start though, I'll just I'll read the gospel passage for us because uh, I like the gospel and I think that it's helpful to see how these things are connected. Uh, so this is in Matthew chapter 10 verses uh, 40 to 42. It says, Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cold, a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. So here Jesus is, you know, he's sending out and he's saying to, um, to his disciples, if, if you are welcomed, they are welcoming me. And again, we have this beautiful picture of they, they are going out to proclaim the kingdom of God. And it's the way that the recipients of this love the messenger uh, is that they bear a reward, a reward for that behavior. So I want you to keep this passage in mind uh, and we'll hear how it echoes the words that Yahweh uh, actually said to Abram uh, in the passage that we'll be reading in a moment. Uh, so, But we will be in Genesis 22 predominantly. So if you want to look that up, uh, it's the story of Abraham uh, who was Abram but is now Abraham at this point in the narrative uh, when he takes Isaac up to Mount Moriah and... Um, uh, in, with the plan to sacrifice his, his child. Now, we know this story because this is a, a story that gets told a lot. Uh, and I'm always amazed when I read storybook Bibles, like that they somehow kind of, they have to try and translate what are oftentimes very difficult portraits of God. So you have a story like the, the story of Noah and there's all these beautiful, colorful animals and they're walking onto the ark, and it's all very lovely. But then they skip the bit where everything else dies. There's no storybook Bible passage, uh, sorry, illustration of all of the corpses bobbing in the water. Like it is a horrifying passage that talks about most of the earth being destroyed and all of the creatures of the earth being destroyed and the people with it. And this is another one of those stories. In the storybook Bible, they often present Isaac uh, as a tiny little baby, uh, not as a young teenager like he likely was at the age of 12 or 13 perhaps. This is a horrifying story where Abraham takes his son, who he can talk to, whom he loves, whom God has made deep promises about, up to a mountain for sacrifice. And so passages like this from the Old Testament present a challenge for Christians. They present a deep challenge because we want to believe that the Word of God is uh, beautiful and inspired even, and uh, we also want to contend that God is like Jesus. Uh, so we don't have the, um, the, the privilege or we don't have the liberty of simply dismissing these passages. We can't just say, oh, well, uh, they weren't true history, because uh, many, many Christians would hold that up until about Abraham is kind of mythological history establishing the, the nature of the relationship between God and humanity and our fallenness and our blessedness. Uh, but from Abraham onwards, most theologians uh, and most historians would say, well, this is the point in, at which the Jewish history, this is where we believe things started to be true history, even if we didn't believe the earlier stuff was. So we don't have to I guess the, the liberty of just saying, ah, it didn't really happen. It doesn't matter. It's just mythological. It's just teaching us something. It's not a true thing. So we've got to come up with a way to either understand these more difficult portraits of God or dismiss them entirely or embrace them and say, yes, it's because God really is like that. 
Uh, now, my fundamental hermeneutic, the way I read the scripture, the way that I view all of um, the history of God's people, the way that I see God is to say that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. This is in, in Hebrews 1. He, uh, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and he is the exact representation of his being. And so whilst God spoke to us in the past through the prophets and in many ways, he now speaks to us through his son. This is, this is like the big theolo theological uh, stuff of the New Testament. Jesus is God. But that leaves me with a whole bunch of questions. So one of the guys that I've been deeply influenced uh, by over many years is a theologian and a pastor named Greg Boyd. And he talks about this challenge of interpreting the more violent portraits of God in the Old Testament or the more angry portraits of God in the Old Testament um, by saying that we need to have a cross-informed lens in which we view God. Uh, and so by, by having a cross-informed lens, we see that on the cross, Jesus is disfigured. We see Jesus as God crucified. We see Jesus as bearing the, the sin of the world. We see a distorted view of God on the cross. And we are willing to accept that that, that distorted view of God as a broken man bearing sin and being, and being tormented, that that is not the whole story. We understand that there is something else going on in the background there. And when we understand what else is going on, it makes everything else kind of fall into place. It makes more sense. So what we need to realize is that the scriptures give us a picture of God from the perspective of a fallen, culturally conditioned people. The Old Testament especially gives us a picture of God through the lens of an ancient Near Eastern people that came from a pagan background viewing Yahweh as one of many gods, albeit the most powerful of the gods, but their view of God was that, that all the gods were violent and capricious. Their view of the gods were that they were fickle and unknowable. This is the view of God that they are bringing to the Old Testament. And then God is slowly over time reshaping their understanding of his nature and his, um, his way of loving and what he is trying to do in the earth. But we sometimes we forget that the, the Old Testament audience and the Old Testament writers didn't have the perspective that we have of Christ. They didn't know the things that we know. They didn't, uh, you know, like if you watch a movie that has like a significant twist in it and then you go back and you watch it again and you're like, oh, I can see it all along. They didn't know the twist. Even when Jesus turned up, they couldn't uh, reconcile their view of Yahweh with what Jesus was saying, so much so that they crucified Jesus. So the idea that the Old Testament gives us a perfect, clear, simple to understand perspective of what God is truly like doesn't do justice to history or to what happened to Christ on the cross. Now, at the same time, we do get some glimpses of the true nature of God throughout history. So my, I think my favorite of the Old Testament prophetic kind of voices is Jonah uh, because he's the whiniest of all of the prophetic voices. He has a big dummy spit because he's like, I knew you would forgive the people of Nineveh uh, and I'm so angry about doing that. I wish that I'd never been born. And like Jonah, I just, he's the toddler of the prophets in my opinion. And, um, but it reveals God's true heart towards these Ninevites who are meant to be the enemies of God's people, he wants to forgive them. He wants to uh, know them. He wants to save them. Uh, and there is, there is a glimpse in that where God is not like the, um, the other gods of the ancient world. So all through the Old Testament, there are these little glimpses. But it's not until we have Jesus that we have the full revelation of God, the Father uh, in the Son, uh, that then shows us what God is like. But I want us to go um, back now. So I'm, I'm getting distracted. Let's go back to Genesis. Uh, we are going to be in Genesis 22, but let's jump back 10 uh, chapters earlier to Genesis 12. And it says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. All right, so here is our first big challenge from God to Abram. So there are repeatedly challenges to Abram, and he fails at many of those challenges. But in this one, he's, God says to him, I want you to leave the country that you were born in. I want you to leave the relatives that you have, and I want you to leave your father's family, and I want you to go to somewhere new. 
This is a big, big deal. Because in the ancient Near Eastern world, tribe was everything. Family was everything. Everyone had a tribe and the tribe kept you safe. It kept you in community. It, it gave you hope for a future. It meant that you weren't worried constantly about your, um, your place in the world because you had tribe. And in that tribe, everyone worked for the betterment of the tribe. Everyone had a role to play. And if you did something that reflected poorly on your tribe, that was the worst thing you could possibly do. So it was an honor-shame culture, and the honor of your family and the honor of your tribe was a really massive big deal. And to bring shame on them was the worst possible thing that a person could do. And so Abram is told, you need to leave your tribe, which is really shameful. It's, a, it's really difficult for him to do that. His father and his father's father, they've always been together. And now God is saying to him, I want you to walk away from everything you've known, from all the safety that you have known, from all the security you've known, from all the honor that you've known, because I have something new for you. What we realize uh, later when the, the scriptures, they, they tell us that, um, that Abraham was a pagan prior to all this. Abraham's family were pagans going all the way back. Uh, at some point after Noah and up until Abram, they'd forgotten about Yahweh largely. And uh, so whilst Abram was able to hear from Yahweh at this time, they were pagans. So he wasn't just saying, I want you to leave your tribe. He was saying, I want you to leave the land. And normally you would have a God that would protect your people and those gods would be territorial. They would be geographic. So they might be a God that resided on a particular mountain or a particular plain or a particular area. And so God is saying, I want you to walk away from your tribe and I want you to walk away from your security and I want you to walk away from your paganism and come and follow me because I am the God who goes with you. I am the God who isn't fixed to a particular place on the earth. I am a God who is going to covenant with you and be fixed with you as a people and through you, all of the nations of the earth. That's the, the narrative that we eventually get to here. So the tribe by nature is a selfish thing. Families by nature are a selfish thing. If one of you came to me and said, uh, I'm unwell and I, I need to spend you know, uh, $100,000 to get a surgery, will you help me? I would try to help you as best I could. But if one of my own family came to me and said, I need this money for this, we would do everything conceivable within our power because even in our family units now, tribe by nature is, is selfish. And the foremost agenda of any tribe or nation is to protect their own interests, their own national interests. And we are still today tribal, uh, just as we were then, but we call it under different names. Uh, and at a national level, we call that patriotism. We care more about our people than we care about other people. So the next verse in Genesis 12, so, so this is where um, Yahweh says, I want you to leave you know, your country and your relatives and go where I tell you. It says... And I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. And it's in this passage that we see an echo uh, later in when Jesus says, when you go out and people are good to you, they're going to get a reward. Because Jesus knows that all the way back at the beginning, God made a promise to Abram and that it is through him that that promise will finally be fulfilled. Everywhere you go, when they receive you, even if they just give you a cup of cold water, they will be blessed. Because it is in God's heart from the beginning to bless not just a tribe, but to make a great tribe of all peoples and all nations and all tongues. Yahweh is not like the other gods. The other gods of the ancient Near Eastern world wanted their people to make them great. So you would say nice things about your God and you would paint nice pictures about your God and you would make an altar out of stone or, or better yet, you would make a temple for your God. I've traveled throughout all of the, um, the, the modern Eastern um, world, but like it, when you're looking in the, um, around Greece and Turkey and uh, Israel and Jordan and the monuments that they've built, the temples that people have built to their gods, like I think we kind of, we can't comprehend it really. 
These are the great wonders of the world. You see things like the pyramids or you see the temple to Apollos or Athena or like these things are massive, massive structures that are designed explicitly to say my God is greater than anybody else's God because it's like all the gods have low self-esteem and they needed their people to puff them up. But Yahweh says, I don't need you to make me feel good. I'm going to make you look good and I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a great name. This is completely the opposite of all of the other pagan gods. This is a God who is invested in his people and in his people being invested in all the nations of the earth so that one day he can reconcile all things unto himself. Yahweh is so different to the other gods. But Abram doesn't know that yet. Abram has this tiny perspective of what all the gods are like and he assumes that Yahweh is the same. He assumes that Yahweh is just like them. Now, the normal pattern of behaviour then in this tribal world was to fight for your land and to fight for your uh, protection and for your family, but also to take what other people had, the spoils of war and the riches of that and the glory for themselves and the glory for their God. And this idea is, um, is punctuated by the fact that your God would go before you. So as you went into war, you would summon or call upon your God to go out before you. And this is even reflected in, in the view of Yahweh that the, the Israelite people had. Uh, in 1 Samuel 17, 45, uh, David replied to the Philistine. This is the story of David and Goliath. So this is the prevailing view of Yahweh. He says, You come at me with sword, spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. You see, David is calling upon Yahweh to go and fight his battle. The armies are the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled and today the Lord will conquer you. See, this was their idea that our God, be it a pagan God or Yahweh, would go out before us and he would help us to smash our enemies to smithereens. Because it was when people attack us, it's our God that they are defaming and our God that they are defiling. So when they went and conquered other tribes, uh, well, what they would do is they'd wipe everybody out because they didn't want that tribe to then one day go strong so that it would come and attack them again. So it, they would wipe out all the fighting men. Perhaps they would um, keep some of the women and children as slaves or concubines or they would just wipe all about the women and all the children. They would steal their land, they would steal their livestock Uh, and this was the cultural norm of the day. This was not considered, like when the Jews are reading this, they celebrate this stuff even though we are kind of like, oh, that's a bit much. This was just what was normally um, viewed. The idea of a violent God bringing about violent victory so that your people could have what other people had was good and righteous and justice. That was, it was not uh, considered to be a scary thing uh, and uh, something that offends the same way it does for us. So tribal identity and lineage and ancestry, these were the things that brought you safety in the ancient world. So without them, you ran the risk of being enslaved. You ran the risk of being conquered. You ran the risk of being exiled. You ran the risk of being murdered. You ran the risk of losing all of your uh, land and property and wealth. So tribe kept you safe. Now, you'll note it's also why hospitality was so important in the ancient world. Imagine that a stranger turns up at your, uh, your home your, and, and you bring him to the patriarch of your people, the king, if you were a big enough group, you would be really nice to any stranger that turned up because you didn't know if they were the herald of an an incoming army. You wanted any visitor that turned up to think you were really good neighbours. You wanted everyone to like you. Hospitality was central because it could mean the survival of your people. It wasn't just because they had a cultural view to be nice. It's because they had a cultural view that said, if we're not nice to our neighbours, they will kill us and take everything. So they were really nice. They took in all of the strangers and aliens because they didn't know what the ramifications of not doing that would be. We know from history, even modern history, that there is an arms race going from, you know, like a, a Bronze Age to a Steel Age. People wanted better weapons so they could protect their tribe. And even now, technology advances because we want better weapons to protect our tribe, to protect our culture, our way of life. 
And in our capitalistic, uh, materialistic societies, we want to protect the gods of um, economic growth and the gods of capitalism and uh, prosperity and materialism. These are the gods that we protect with our increasing stash of weapons. What we have is more important than what someone else has, and we will steal it if we need to, and we will defend it with blood if we must. But there were beautiful things about tribe as well. They ate together, they lived together, they served together, they cared for one another. They were so dependent on one another because they couldn't depend on the external things in their world. They didn't understand how the weather worked. They didn't understand. Uh, they, they had history that would tell them how things happen. But if it didn't rain, they didn't know why. And they thought maybe God or the gods, they're angry with us. This is, this is how religion begins. This is the beginning of religious life. It's not raining. We'll pray to God. It's not raining. The sun comes up every day and goes down every evening. This happens every day. We need the sun for our crops to grow. We will worship the sun. And we will have a God of the water and a God of the woods and a God of prosperity and a God for fertility and a God of war and a God of everything because every aspect of our life is largely outside of our control and we need to make sure that all of the gods like us so that we survive as a people. So when there wasn't enough, they would offer sacrifice. And when there was enough, they would offer blessing sacrifice. They would burn an offering and they would uh, pre present something to an altar and they would sing and they would dance and they would worship. They would do anything they could in order to keep the gods happy because the gods didn't really tell them what they wanted all that much. So when you have a god that doesn't know what, you don't know how to keep them happy, you just keep increasing the sacrifice in a hope that the benevolence of the gods will allow you to live another day. And eventually, all of these different aspects of life all had different gods. People attributed their good fortune to God and they attributed their misfortune to God. And thus began religion. And then the practice of seeking the fortune and being penitent about wrongdoing to avoid misfortune, the ritual involved in that became religion. So I can understand in that context why ancient Near Eastern peoples offered sacrifice. It makes sense to me why they did that. And so God condescends to the people of Israel and he says, this is how you understand already. When you offer sacrifice, you get to feel like you're off the hook now. When my kids have done something wrong, we, there is a punishment of sorts. There is a consequence. There is something that happens. And part of that is so that they know that it's done and dealt with now. They can move on from the offence because there has been some sacrifice. So for the ancient peoples, sacrifice was how they understood we stopped God being or God's being angry with us. The problem with a system like this is that you're never really sure if you've done enough. And so the amount of sacrifice and the amount of ritual continues to increase and ultimately, it leads to child sacrifice. So on the fringes of the, uh, the ancient Near Eastern world, in every culture, we find at the very fringe of all of them, someone was sacrificing children because they thought that was the biggest sacrifice that they could make. That was normal in pagan society. Now, we, um, this is not what I'm looking at today, but... Yahweh's response to this, like I said, was to stoop and say, this is how you understand being set free from the bad choices you've made. So Yahweh condescended and said, I will let you do that as well. In the same way that Yahweh condescended and said, I will let you have a king because you're desperate. Uh, because he's, the people want to be like everybody else and God wants to connect with them. So he's like, if you need this to connect. But later on, we know he says, your sacrifices are meaningless if you're not nice to each other. God didn't actually need them to sacrifice things in order to forgive them. It was part of what they needed in order to felt forgiven. But then God introduces things like the Ten Commandments because he's like, I want you to know how to relate to me. I want you to know what's right and wrong. I want you to know so that you don't always live in constant fear 
that I'm going to do something awful. I'm going to destroy you because that's what all the other gods did. So the rules and regulations of the of the early um, books of the Torah and uh, they're there because God's saying, I want you to know how to relate to me so that you don't have anxiety in your faith, so that you don't constantly live in fear like all of the other ancient peoples. Now we get to Genesis 22. And we'll, uh, I won't read this whole passage because I think we all know the story, but I'll just give you the, the highlights. It starts out in Genesis 22. It says, some time later, uh, which I think uh, it can more helpfully be translated uh, to kind of say, after a lot of things that happened. Other stuff happened. So originally, we go back 10 chapters, God says, I'm gonna, I want you to leave where you are, go somewhere new, uh, and I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And then a whole bunch of stuff happens like, uh, Abraham doesn't have great faith. Abraham has been told, you and Sarah are going to have a kid and it's going to be a big deal. But twice, uh, Abraham pretends that Sarah is not his wife uh, and kind of pimps her out. It's an awful thing that happened because he's nervous that they're going to get wiped out and he doesn't have faith in God. So I suspect God's a bit annoyed with Abraham, to be honest. Uh, and so sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, not the other one. Just clarifying here. Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. And we, so this is why we believe that this scene is set upon Mount Moriah, which then became the Temple Mount, which is where um, in now modern Jerusalem sits and the... the um, the, that's where it all happened on that mountain. This is where we think that same place was. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Uh, yeah, so it gets it gets worse. He, so he goes on and he goes up the mountain. Now, thankfully, uh, Abraham, does, uh, Abraham does say, me and the boy are going to come back down together. So we get this impression that Abraham really did have this underlying faith that God was going to fix this. Maybe God would raise Isaac from the dead after the fact. Um, But Abraham did say, we're both going up, we're both coming back down. Which is the apologetic way of explaining this text. Um, If you have no better way to explain it, you just say, clearly, uh, Abraham knew better. I think it's more likely Abraham was scared of his wife uh, and so said, yes, I promise you we're both coming back, but he didn't really know what was going to happen. So they go up there, Abraham um, prepares to sacrifice his son. I can't even conceive. The thing that I find most confronting about this passage is that Abraham never questions God. The paganism inside of Abraham was so absolute, so total. His dedication to his worldview of pagan gods being mean and capricious and violent was so certain and so deeply embedded that when God called him to do this horrific, awful thing, he never questions it. Never once in this passage does he say, are you sure? I don't think that's a good idea. And I find that so deeply upsetting. When they arrived at the place, this is from verse 9, where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. And then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And thankfully, before he could go through with anything, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And I, it never addresses Abraham's heart in this story. But when I put myself into that story, the relief when Abraham says, yes, here I am, the relief must have been just so complete. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And then Abraham looks up and there is a ram caught in a thicket and they take the ram and they they sacrifice the ram. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yira, which means the Lord will provide And to this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord, who is a a picture of 
of Jesus, the angel of the Lord then kind of retells this promise that was told to Abraham so so many years earlier. He says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And all your offspring... Um, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because they, because you have obeyed me. And then we have this, this is why the, the Matthew passage echoes this. Jesus is saying, God promised at the beginning that he would bless all of humanity. And he sends his disciples out and he says, now go and anyone that receives you will be blessed. But we still have to deal with the fact that God put Abraham in this situation. Now, I think in this story, we get both the pagan view of God that was common amongst ancient Near Eastern peoples, even amongst the Jews. We get both the pagan view and we also get the revelation of God's true nature. We get both the pagan view and the revelation of God's true nature. The pagan view is God is perfectly happy with child sacrifice and the revelation of God's true nature is when he says, absolutely, do not do that. Greg Boyd says of this that, um, that this is a pedagogical, it's a teaching strategy to purge lingering pagan elements of Abraham's conception of Yahweh. Um, this is what's at work when Yahweh stoops to take on the appearance of an ancient Near Eastern deity who demands child sacrifice. This is... Uh, uh, what Greg Boyd would call the principle of cruciform accommodation. God allows himself on the cross to look not very godly. And in the same way, we see stories of God in the, in the scriptures that allow him to look not very much like Christ. But we know on the cross something else is going on. It's not just the bloody death of a person bearing sin of the whole world. It's also the beginning of the restoration of all things and the dealing with of sin and death for eternity and forever and for the destruction of the schemes of the devil. We know on the cross something else is going on. And so when we read these pictures, uh, of these difficult portraits of an ancient Near Eastern violent deity that Yahweh is presented as at times in this Old Testament, we know that something else is truly going on and that God is just bearing their broken, fallen picture of him in order to move them along. And at this point, we get a clear delineating kind of shift in the worldview of Abraham. My God does not delight in child sacrifice. This is like the big rule at the beginning that came before the Ten Commandments. God wanted to establish it very early on here. This is not something I'm into. Don't do this. God stooped to accommodate Abraham's broken cultural perspective, but then he stands up and he reveals his true nature. And in Christ, we have, we have God standing up and saying, this is what I am truly like. You see, Christ does stoop. He stoops for the woman caught in adultery and he stoops um, to, be, um, to be take on our burden and our, and our, uh, our sin. He stoops and, and he carries that for us, but then he stands up and he breaks free of sin and death. In Jesus, we see the true nature and character of God. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God's being. He's not the broken shadow that we see in the inception of God in Yahweh that would want a child to die or the picture of Yahweh that would curse people or the picture of Yahweh that would wipe out in genocidal rage all, all of humanity. This is not what God is truly like. Something else is going on. And this is the principle that I would say we need to hold in mind when we read things or we experience things in our life where we're like, this doesn't seem to look like Jesus. There is always going to be mystery in our faith, which is uh, the, the video we watched before from Rachel Held Evan where she talked about doubt. And she says we need to hold things loosely. It's because... We're always going to have questions. We're always going to have mystery. We're always going to have uncertainty, but we, we don't need to have uncertainty about the nature and character of God because it is revealed in Jesus. 
It is revealed in Jesus as he dies for us, and it's revealed in Jesus as he uh, rises from the dead, and it's revealed in Jesus as he is kind to all the wrong people. He's kind to the tax collectors and the, the foreigners and the broken and the sick and the needy. He is kind to all of those people, and it shows us what God is truly like and what God has always been truly like, even though the picture of God was distorted for so long before that. In the midst of the challenges of our life, in the midst of the challenges of the Scriptures, we need to hold things loosely and know that there are beautiful glimpses of what God is like in our life, and there are beautiful glimpses of what God is like all through the Scripture. There are moments of unusual compassion, there are, uh, and in the Scripture we see a call to justice and mercy and generosity and charity in a way that is deeply cultural to the ancient Near Eastern world, but also to our own world. And these things show us what God is like, a God that desires mercy, not sacrifice, a God that desires peace and patience and kindness and goodness and love and self-control, a God that is incredibly charitable. That word agape uh, that we talk about in terms of love, it's a charitable love. It gives without thought of of return. This is what God is truly like and what God has always been like. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would uh, be prepared to hold things loosely and like Abraham, have our hearts and minds changed. I don't know that any of us truly know you uh, in a perfect way. So I pray that we would be willing to, to allow our view to change even deeply held historic, tribal, family, ancestral, all the things that, from our past, our history, even the things from, um, that we've been given by our, our, our mentors and our teachers and our parents, that we would hold them loose enough to know that, that you are more beautiful than we can conceive and more merciful than we know and more gracious and that your justice um, and your righteousness don't, don't lead you to vengeance or anger, or violence, but rather you are a God of of great forgiveness, great kindness. I pray that we would be a people of great forgiveness and great kindness, and that you would reshape and reform how we see you and know you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're right on on 12 o'clock. Um, but I'd love it if we could give some thought, either right now if you're very keen, but, but later uh, and during this week, give some thought to when you last kind of were challenged to change your picture of God. When you were last challenged, because I think we can, we can think that we've been doing this a long time and we get a really certain view of what Yahweh is like, And we might not have a moment where the angel of the Lord speaks clearly to us and says, change your idea. But I would ask that we earnestly seek God, that we contemplate, that we review the scriptures and we review our heart and we say, God, where is it that I have seen you wrong or represented you wrong or misunderstood you? Please change me. Uh, Because I think that doubt is the great seed of faith and growth. Uh, Not that we doubt God's kindness or God's love or God's reality, but that we hold just a little bit of doubt in perhaps the way that we see him and the things that we think we know uh, and that we are willing to accept a a broader, more beautiful picture of God. Um, So I just, I would encourage and challenge you to do that this week and to talk about that. Have the humility to say to someone, you know, I thought this, but maybe, maybe that wasn't right. Wrestle with it. Because whilst Abraham didn't question God in that moment, the, the great Jewish tradition, the rabbinic tradition, is that questioning and coming up with a different way to see it. Again and again, they just kept coming at it. And I, and I think that we need to do that as well, instead of being so fundamentalist. Um, I don't think that doubt is the deconstruction of our faith. It's the deepening of our faith. And I'll, I'll leave it at that.